Thanks be to God for his word to us. Our question at this time, and we'll also be referring to uh, a reading from Zechariah chapter 8 from verse 15 to chapter 9 verse 10. The question that I want to ask us as a church is, what is Jesus saying to us during this Easter season? What is Jesus saying? Like I said, I often mix up my messages. I think to myself, what do the people need to hear? What do the people want to hear? What do I want to say? What do I think you need to hear? Where do I think we should be heading as a church? I was quite stuck when it came to the the Easter plan. What should we do in COVID and celebrating Palm Sunday and looking forward to Good Friday and Easter Sunday? When I realized that I need to be asking not what should we do, what do we want to do, but rather what does Jesus want us to do? And when we think like that, it makes us think quite differently about what's going on. What does Jesus want from us? So I pray, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, we pray. Amen. What is Jesus saying? And we often don't realize that Jesus is definitely saying something quite loudly to us when he silently rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. We know that Jesus is saying something quite loudly to us when he quietly washes his disciples' feet. We know that he is speaking quietly to us when he doesn't talk back at his trial. He simply says, it is as you say. During this Holy Week, I hope that I'll offer some insight into what Jesus is saying, and maybe we'll journey together to find out something of the answer to the question, what is Jesus saying to us right now in this moment at this time? Maybe I should be a little more humble and not say that I'm going to tell you what Jesus is saying, but say I invite you to listen with me to what Jesus is saying through these scriptures that we're reading, through these accounts that we're hearing, and figure out what it is God has to say to us at this time. For those on Facebook, you're lucky you won't be able to see my face because it's coming and going on the the video camera, but you can still see the words on the screen. So John, in John chapter 12, quotes from Zechariah chapter 9. But we remember that John said, do not be afraid, a daughter of Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. But when we read Zechariah chapter 9, we see that it's not word for word. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion, shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem, lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we make a big mistake when we say, look, see how Jesus fulfills the prophecies of old. Uh, how, could a, how could the prophet have known what Jesus would do? But we need to realize that Jesus had read the prophet and knew what the prophet said in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and the reading around that. And in those days, people didn't say, go look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, because it was only when lawyers got hold of the Bible that they put chapters and verses in. In Jesus' time, to quote a passage of Scripture was to invoke a picture from a part of Scripture or to mention a part. Or even in the case of John chapter 12, saying, do not be afraid, and coming to the end, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt, would be to invoke not just that one verse, the whole story that comes from Zechariah chapter 8 through to chapter 9. Jesus doesn't run into Jerusalem shouting, I am your king. Instead, he presents himself in Jerusalem as an offering. An offering to us and to the people to say, you are our king. 
a proposal that we are allowed to accept or reject. When Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, yes, it is as you say. We get to choose whether he will be our king or not. But do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion, or the praise, do not be afraid, comes much earlier in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 15. So now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. When Jesus gets on the donkey, he is invoking Zechariah, and he is telling us, I think, do not be afraid. In Zechariah chapter 8, verse 15, the verse says, Just as I had determined to bring disaster upon you, and showed no pity when your fathers angered me, says the Lord Almighty. So now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. Every now and again, you get one of those WhatsApps or those messages that people send around saying this pandemic is a punishment from God because of all the evil of the world. I think that kind of message is undone by the way in which Jesus approaches the temple, invoking Zechariah. In the past, God determined to bring disaster and showed no pity. But Jesus is saying, do not be afraid. This is a new regime. This is a new understanding. We are to accept God as our King, as Jesus, who comes in peace, in gentleness. He doesn't come with violence, anger, but comes as an offering, inviting us to love. Jesus comes saying, do not be afraid. God comes saying, do not be afraid. The prophet goes on to speak about what the people should do in response to the coming of this king. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. And render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against your neighbor. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. Jesus' simple message in arriving on a donkey is a call to us to revisit this passage. Remember these values, these truths, to make them part of our lives to remind us of the promise that Zechariah makes in chapter 8, verse 22. Many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat Him. The promise that the world will turn and see what Jesus is like, what God is like. If only we hold up God in the image of Jesus as Jesus is in the image of God. If only we take a moment to, to delete all our ideas of God that are not compatible with a Jesus picture of God, realize that this compelling and beautiful picture of God that we see at Easter, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, is the true image of who God is. God in Christ arrives on a donkey, coming in gentleness and peace, coming not with a, with a sword to shed blood, but in peace to bring his love and grace, to call us to truth and justice. In those days, says the prophet, ten men from all languages and nations 
will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. That's the promise that, that Jesus is reminding the people of as he comes to the temple riding on a donkey, inviting us to follow him, to know that that message of grace and love that he brings will be so compelling that people will grab onto your robes and ask to go with you to get to know him because they know that God is with you. The king on a donkey is a promise of God's good favor. God's resolution to do good to his people. God's simple command, be fair, true, just, don't do evil. And the promise of God's victory over powers that are not just. As we get closer to chapter 9, verse 9, that speaks of the, the king coming on a donkey, Zechariah, I nearly said Isaiah, speaks about Tyre and, and um, Zebulon, uh, Naphtali, and these nations that have been oppressing the people. It talks about how God will defeat those nations. In those days, maybe the understanding would have been a political interpretation. For the people of Jerusalem, the Roman occupation was a problem. Even the temple was controlled by the Roman oppressors. The priest could not get his robes without permission from the ruling authorities. The king coming on a donkey in those days is a promise that those political powers will be overthrown. But after his resurrection, Jesus helps his disciples to see that his victory is much bigger than one over Rome. The disciples say, is this the time when you will return the kingdom to Israel? Jesus points the disciples out to the world around them to say, in a sense, that the kingdom of God is much bigger than this. So we begin to understand that God defeats those forces that oppress us that are more than just political powers and injustice. But those inward forces that, that mess up our lives and the lives of those around us. Those addictions, that hatred, that anxiety, all of those things that, that, that mess us up and mess up our lives, God is promising to defeat all of that in Jesus as Jesus comes to the temple. Do not be afraid. Here comes your king. I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now I am keeping watch, says God. Jesus comes to say the same. But we know that that temple that stood when Jesus arrived now lies in ruins. In the scriptures we learn that we are the temple. Our bodies, selves, us. We are the house. I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Perhaps Jesus is saying to us, I can defeat those things that overwhelm you. I can lift your burdens. I can relieve you of your sin and your addiction and your brokenness. I can heal you. Do not be afraid. He doesn't come with a sword, except for the sword of his word. He doesn't come with violence and judgment. He comes with a proposal. He comes with grace. He comes to bring peace, not fear. Jesus quietly and, in a sense, silently 
gets on a donkey to march into Jerusalem. As Jesus silently washes his disciples' feet, as Jesus, with just a few words, hangs on the cross, he is offering us a sort of proposal. Can I be your king? Will you let me be your king? Gentle, humble, riding on a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nation. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Amen.